Hello, everyone. So today I'm going to make a uh, different kind of video, some just-in-time content. Um, this is just sort of, you know, for your own edification. This isn't going to be part of your normal coursework or anything. Um, but um, I've come across something that I consider to be interesting, uh, and I wanted to uh, to share it with everybody. Uh, because it's uh, pertinent, I think, to some of the things that we've been learning about as they pertain to game theory. So I'm calling this video Game Theory, Plumo, and the Art of Fair Play Deception. So uh, today, essentially what I want to do is talk about an example of the practical application of game theory. So we use game theory all the time. But when teaching game theory, and maybe this is just me, uh, I might be the only one with this problem. I don't know of a lot of people who teach game theory to begin with. But what I have noticed is that with my instruction and the instruction that I've received from others is that we often resort to relatively simple examples. Now, thanks to the rise of online streaming, we actually have a wealth of examples available to us because, as seems obvious, game theory is employed all the time in gaming. Now, the problem is, is that most people who stream games do so uh, for the entertainment value. And as such, their gamesmanship, as it were, isn't always necessarily top-notch, or certainly not what I would consider to be a uh, graduate-level understanding of game theory or, or practical game theory. But um, there are the occasional diamonds in the rough, and I believe that I have found one that I would like to share with you. So uh, let's, before we get into that, however, let's go over a little bit of the pretext here. So modern games are all general variants of a few simple types of games, right? So you've got single player PVE or player versus environment, where a single player is pit against challenges programmed into the narrative of the game. Then you have individual PvP, or player versus player, where a player is pit against the challenge presented by other players. Then you also have co-op PvE, where a group of players is pit against challenges within the game, and co-op PvP, where a group of players competes against other players to complete objectives. Now, of these, co-op PvP presents the most potential for the analysis of game theory due to the multiple evolving variables throughout the course of a game. In fact, the popularity of one specific uh, game in this genre is, in my opinion, the most fertile ground for that, and that is the social deception genre, also known as the social investigation genre, or it goes by several other names. But I believe this uh, is due to the fact that, that player agendas are hidden from the start, allowing players to develop a wide variety of strategies to succeed which is what you get in the social deduction genre that you don't sometimes get in others. Because remember, uh, in game theory, uh, there is the, the games will set the tone and the rules and strategies will develop as a result of essentially limitations imposed within the game. But the social deduction genre gives us that, but in addition to that, uh, well, it gives us the added layer essentially of other player strategies. Now, there are several well-known titles in this genre. Uh, there is Among Us, which reached its peak popularity around mid-2020, uh, and that's probably the one you are most familiar with if you're not really into the genre. However, each game will have idiosyncrasies that can dramatically alter gameplay and thus strategies. So in the case of Among Us, these quirks do not make it a worthy case for game theory analysis, at least in my opinion. Um, you know, this is not a game development critique lecture, so I'll just leave it at that. We will get into some of the details here in just a moment. That said, there is one game in this genre that I have personally found to be very compelling. Uh, it's not the most popular game. It boasts a player base of around 72,000 at the time of this recording, um, but it does seem to strike the right balance, at least in my opinion again, uh, by providing a consistent rule set to make up a sandbox for players. And this allows players themselves to discover the best ways to use and abuse that sandbox to complete the game. So when analyzing game theory, that's what we want. Inevitably, player choices and strategies will be influenced by the game, but we certainly want to avoid games that intentionally or inadvertently create a space that results in as few pure strategies as possible. If one action is always best, then it's no longer interesting to analyze. 
So the game I'm referring to now is called Dread Hunger, and oddly enough, I have never personally played it. Uh, I don't generally have the time for multiplayer games, however, I do follow the game and I watch streamers that play it simply for the entertainment value of seeing their strategies in action. So we will be watching some of these videos together in uh, this lecture series. Um, so uh, before we do that, however, I would like to take a moment to remind everyone that this is supplemental material. It's not required for course completion. Dread Hunger is a game that takes place within the context of an Arctic exploration mission a la the Franklin Expedition circa the mid-19th century. As such, it contains themes that some students may find uncomfortable. Uh, these include cannibalism and gore. Uh, so keep this in mind should you choose to continue to watch this or the other linked videos that I'll be providing to you. Uh, I will be using the chapters feature as best I can to organize the rest of this video, so you can also try to skip around uh, if you're already familiar with the game itself. In particular, we're going to go over the basics of the game so that you can understand more or less what you're going to be seeing in these videos that I'll, I'll link to you. So, uh, part one here, framing the game. Uh, so as a game, Dread Hunger is a mixture of a survival simulator and social deception game. A team of eight players, each assigned with roles or classes, join an Arctic expedition. The game begins as the winds die and the boiler must be fueled to move the ship down a short passage through the ice. The roles each player uh, have are randomly assigned uh, and are positions on the ship. So there'll be a captain, a navigator, engineer, cook, hunter, royal marine, doctor, and chaplain. Each begins with different starting equipment and benefits throughout the game. So, for example, the cook begins with a meat cleaver and can use the cooking uh, action up to 30% faster than other players. Uh, the latter benefit increases as the players gain experience levels with that class, incentivizing players to continue playing to max out that benefit. The goal of the game is to move the ship through the passage before four quote-unquote days have passed, at which point a massive blizzard arrives and the crew all perish. Um, I say quote-unquote day because a day is actually around 10 minutes or so, meaning that the crew has at the very most 50 minutes to complete their objective and reach open water before the unforgiving Arctic claims the lives of the crew. Now, there are, uh, as I have explained, two layers to this game. The survival game layer alone presents a challenge. No player begins the game with enough resources to survive and move the ship to the end by themselves. They must be obtained on the map. So while some players have successfully completed maps solo, in general the crew must work together to gather the resources necessary to keep the crew alive and move the ship before they run out of time. This is the survival game layer that presents a universal challenge to all players and, and later provides uh, the context for the social deception game on the second layer. Um, so this first layer revolves around a tightly controlled game economy as it is a series of taps, drains, and converters. And if you have forgotten our early lectures on game theory and design, uh, to go over those just very briefly, drains are like, for example, player health, hunger, and warmth. They must eat to stay warm uh, or their health pool is affected. Hunger requires food, of which there are several types. Eating human meat satisfies the hunger drain temporarily but penalizes the player by making regular food less satisfying. Warmth requires heat sources and is used to generate the game's, uh, sorry, is used to regulate the game's pace. Uh, moving under the cover of night is penalized with a more severe warmth drain in the dark, forcing a player to remain near a heat source. Resources can be converted to overcome this, but generally at the expense of the benefits of moving in the night. So you have a visible light source you carry with you, making you a beacon in the night for other potential players to attack. Health, as with most games, is deprived through combat or as a penalty for not mining the hunger and warmth drains. The map will contain various NPC combatants in the form of wildlife like wolves and polar bears, or with hostile cannibals that attack on sight. Of course, other players can also attack each other, resulting in health loss as well. Taps in this game are nodes that contain certain resources. Coal sleds contain coal, which can either be placed in the boiler to move the ship or convert it into gunpowder. Doctor bags contain dried herbs or laudanum, which can be used for healing, converted into tea, or converted into poison. There are several other nodes, each of which can provide something of a clue to players on where to find the resources that they seek. 
Converters in the game take the form of various crafting nodes, workbenches, and stoves, which can be used to convert resources from one form to another. Iron scrap can be converted into nails to repair the ship, various different weapons, or other useful tools. Gunpowder can be converted into ammunition for a flintlock pistol or into an explosive powder keg. There are a finite number of resources on each map, and conversion cannot be undone, so smart use of resources is important and should be done should not be done rashly. Uh, the most critical resource of these is coal, because coal is used to move the ship forward. It must be placed in the ship's boiler to provide steam power. The crew can, if they must, use other fuel sources like wood or even their own weapons to fuel the ship, but it does not provide nearly the same power as coal. For this reason, finding and getting coal back to the ship is the main objective for the crew. So players must balance all of this with a very limited inventory. Each player only has eight inventory slots to start, but can craft an item in each match to expand that to ten. In addition, uh, barrel items can be crafted to hold coal, further expanding inventory space at the expense of other resources, where the most, uh, whereas most resources can be stacked in 5 or 10 of each type. Uh, each lump of coal takes up one inventory slot on its own, so every player must choose their priorities carefully when scavenging for items off the ship. That is the survival game layer. The other layer of the game is the social deception layer. So as if all of this wasn't difficult enough, the crew must contend with one other problem. Two of the eight crew members are secretly thralls of an evil ancient god and are committed to preventing the crew from completing their objective. These two players are chosen randomly at the start of a match and their identities are kept secret from all players at the outset of the game. Now in this game, it's actually balanced slightly in favor of the thralls. Time is against the crew, and it's up to them to complete their objectives before time runs out. For example, if a crew simply does nothing, the thralls will win by default. It, by, starting under the, by starting the game under these conditions, it becomes their game to lose. Thralls may win by doing anything they can to either kill or simply slow down the crew. In addition to creating bombs or poisons, thralls also have a set of mystical abilities to hamper the crew, such as summoning cannibals to attack a player, creating a whiteout to limit player visibility, or having the ability to see the location of other, mem other players on the map, uh, and also traveling quickly and invisibly around the map. Each player has two quote-unquote lives in the game. If a player's health pool runs out, they can restore their health if they can reach a bed, which provides a short counter and saves them. If not, then they die and they are sent back to the ship and put into the brig, where another player must use a key to release them. If they die a second time, they must sit out the game as a spectating ghost and just wait out the remainder of the match. Thralls are able to release themselves from the brig after their first death, but that is a sure sign to an observant crew of their thrall status. So this means that for the Thrall and crew, the cognitive load in each game can be quite high, as their players must manage inventory, resources, observe other player actions to deduce motivations, work together, and take steps to complete their objectives and quickly adapt to setbacks. It also means that the quality of the experience of a Dread Hunger game is vastly more reliant on the quality of the player than the game itself, as a crew that simply refuses to work together or spends their time endlessly making as much food as humanly possible without completing other objectives is doomed to failure. So as I began watching Dread Hunger videos, I noticed this was true of the experience as an observer as well. Many streamers are entertainers that seek to create content for views, but I found that the unforgiving nature of the game didn't leave much room for entertaining shenanigans the way that games like Among Us had. Uh, in that case, in Among Us, the game is balanced instead slightly in favor of the crew, meaning that there's more room for the crew to kind of do what it does in the meantime without having to worry about objectives as much. But ironically, these characteristics of the game have likely contributed to being less immediately popular in the genre, because it's a less fun party game and requires more dedicated attention and planning. Conversely, with the players, with the wrong players, it can make for a pretty poor experience. Which brings me to my final part, before we actually get into the game itself. Uh, it got me thinking, what is the difference between a good player versus a great player? Um, so... As at least in terms of like 
a good player versus a great player in Dread Hunger. So to be clear, there are certain things that any player can do to improve their performance in any game. This would take a bad player to a good player, and just any describing words I'm using, bad, good, and great, consider all to be enclosed in air quotes because these are all subjective terms. But there are things that anyone can do in any game to go from being a bad player to a good player, and for lack of a better term. Things like learning maps, learning roles, learning skills and abilities, learning inventory management, practicing PvP combat. All of these can be, uh, you know, learn. You can learn these things. You can learn to play more efficiently to eliminate wasted time. Uh, you can understand random loot tables on the tap nodes and all of this. These are all essentially universal to any gaming experience and with enough experience and practice can be obtained by expending an appropriate amount of time and learning these systems. In addition to this, there are certain strategies which will seem readily apparent to most. Since Dread Hunger is a Thrall's game to lose, you could simply obtain weapons as soon as possible and begin stalking the crew immediately. Since they can release themselves from the brig, they have much less to lose in this strategy, but it is a gamble. A crew that works together will outnumber the Thralls, making it a risky proposition to attack outright. Poisoning the crew takes time, resources, and close contact. Throwing out or destroying coal is also risky, as the most valuable resource it is sure to go noticed if it's missing. So, simply view the thrall's role, viewing the thrall's role as anything that helps the crew is bad is not a sophisticated strategy. Dread Hunger is not a zero-sum game and has very few equilibrii. So, what is a good uh, player versus what is a good thrall? So what we can do is take a look at the game and boil this down to the following. A good crewmate is one that assists the crew in completing objectives by gathering resources, clearing paths to objectives, creating useful items, and moving the ship through the pa passage. Protecting crewmates from thralls and NPCs, healing them if possible, calling out suspected thrall behavior, and assisting downed players, releasing them from the, the brig after their first death. Conversely, a good thrall is one that hampers completion of objectives by misusing or destroying resources, frustrating crew efforts to reach objectives, creating harmful items, and sabotaging the ship to slow it down, selectively attacking crewmates that mistakenly isolate themselves, remain anonymous until an opportunity arises to capitalize on the element of surprise, covers for their thrall partner, and finally sows mistrust among the crewmates. Now, as I said, going from a bad player to a good player means practicing basic universal skills of gameplay and learning those roles of what makes a good crewmate and a good thrall. To reinforce this, Dread Hunger actually has a point system for players that awards points for roughly playing according to these principles. But that does not answer the question of what is the difference between a good player and a great player. That brings me to Plumo. So about two months ago or so, it's kind of hard. I, I don't really keep track of exactly when I come across these things, but um, you know, uh, no more than three months ago or so, I came across a YouTube channel from an Aussie streamer named Plumo. And he seems to be primarily active on Twitch, but posts videos to YouTube as well. Um, and it's amazing that he doesn't have more subscribers on YouTube than he does. It's, it's kind of insane. Um, but I have been binge watching his videos ever since, and his performance in Dread Hunger inspired me to share this lecture with you, because when answering the question of what's the difference between a good Dread Hunger player and a great Dread Hunger player, I look to Plumo for the answer to that, because he is what I would describe as a player's player, if you will. That is to say that it seems he has mastered the fundamentals and elevates the game, and has taught me what the difference between a good player and a great player is in this game. And I would like to take a look at some of his videos that he's posted to YouTube, walk through them so we can analyze his strategy. And as we do, I'm going to encourage all of you to sharpen your game theory skills uh, by going ahead and uh, creating your uh, payoff matrices, uh, go ahead and do your decision trees, your strategy trees, and uh, we may have an informal discussion about this in class where you can provide uh, your own feedback on some of the strategies that you see Plumo and the people he's playing with um, sort of develop over the course of some of these videos.
Okay, so I will uh, link to a couple of Plumo's videos directly in the description of this video on or on Canvas. I'll probably put it uh, I'll put it on Canvas, but I will probably also include it in the description of the YouTube posting. Uh, simply so that they're easier for you to reference. Uh, and then there will be separate commentary videos um, on Plumo's videos, uh, which I will also share. All right.